the point of this is to provide the best facts driven show that we possibly can ideally you have a glue guy who is good hashtag glue guy hashtag locker room guy you can't go sign bobby holy to a trillion dollars you can't do these things very satisfying the absolute best nyr show in town this is the liberty blue liberty blue Rangers Podcast. Rangers Podcast. With Andrew Chelby. Andrew Chelby. And Nick Zoraris. Nick Zoraris. Rangers fans, welcome to the best Rangers podcast in town. I am Andrew Chelney alongside Nick Zararis, and we are Liberty Blue. We scream about the Rangers so that you can save your voice. That's how deeply we care about you, and we appreciate that you've joined us for the ride. This is episode five live on Twitch. We'll put the live video up on our YouTube, Liberty Blue Pod, and the audio version will be available as an audio podcast as well on Apple and Spotify and wherever you get your podcasts. Search Liberty Blue on your favorite podcast platform, and it should be there at Liberty Blue Pod on Twitter and Instagram at Chelney Andrew, C-H-E-L-N-E-Y Andrew, and Nick Zararis at Nick Z-A-R-A-R-I-S are our personal handles to follow as well. By the way, you can't, you won't be able to hear us as we are live on Twitch, but as we put them up onto our YouTube and our, and our audio platforms as well, th- we have an open who uh, that was made by the incredible Jake Albee. So much, much, much needed. Thank you to, to Jake. He did a phenomenal job with that. I hope you like it because we do. I, we think it's outstanding. And Jake, you did a, a really, really great job. So hats off to you. We, we really couldn't ask for more. Thank you so much, man. Uh, so, Nick, a lot of things went down in the NHL draft the uh, last couple of days. Yeah, no, I was on my way to the Met game on Thursday night. And for whatever reason, whenever I go to a Met game on either the day free agency opens or the day of the draft, that's usually when something immense happens because I'm nowhere near my computer and I'm not on Twitter. So I kind of see it delayed reaction. So I was sitting there trying to refresh my phone constantly while eating ice cream out of a helmet and keeping score at the game. So I was the first thing I really want to touch on because I think it really sets uh, a tone on where the league is at is the Debrinket stuff. Debrinket getting traded for A pretty middling return is a clear-cut sign from one of the league's marquee franchises that tanking is in vogue. It is the clear-cut accepted strategy when you are a GM taking over a bad situation. If you are smart, you are going to bottom out as quickly as possible, shed as much salary as you can, and worry about the problems of not having any talent two or three years down the road from now. Alex Dabrinkit is why you draft in the top five or 10. You want the ability to have somebody on your roster who can score 40 goals while making below market value. The entire NHL salary structure is set up to favor teams who draft well. If you draft well and you are able to turn a second round pick like Dabrinkit was into a bona fide NHL player, you are going to keep his cost down a lot better than you would if you were to go out on the first day of unrestricted free agency, which is a few days from now, and then pay the sticker price for whatever Johnny Gaudreau is going to cost. Johnny Gaudreau is going to probably cost north of $10 million per season. Dabrinkit's qualifying offer was, I believe, $9 million for this upcoming season, which which is part of why the Blackhawks were trading him. So when you trade somebody who's only 24 years old, who's had two 40 goal seasons and would have had three if he didn't get hurt during the 56 game season last year, you are telling your fans one, there's no point in paying this guy X amount of millions per year when the team is bad. And from a finance perspective, That makes sense to me. There's no point in paying somebody nine, $10 million a season on a team that is bad. If your team is bad, there is no point in overpaying for talent that is not going to be able to do anything. They'll get their counting stats, but they won't be able to win hockey games. And that also sends a message to your fans that there is no point in particularly going to games, being invested in the team, or caring more or less for the next couple of years. Because if we're trading away guys who are 24 years old and not even in their statistical primes yet, there's no point. Uh, The Rangers did this. They did not go as down to the studs as Chicago appears to want to do, 
But the Rangers did come pretty close to trading everything that wasn't nailed down over the course of their rebuild. So if the Rangers can do this, if the Blackhawks can do this, the Leafs did it before both of them. If three of the six original six franchises can absolutely tear it down to the studs, I think it's safe to say that tanking is the clear cut strategy for a new new general manager group when they come into play. Yes and no. I the, for the Rangers, they never tra- traded away a twenty four year old kid like Alex Brinkett, right? They they ne- they didn't have one, and they didn't trade somebody like this away. I think the the Chicago Blackhawks not only are tearing it down, and and by all accounts, this twenty twenty three draft is going to be incredible, right? There's yeah. there's a lot of names out there that are like this. That this is supposed to be the draft of the decade of the last ten years. Like this is going to be it. Supposedly, there's a lot of talent coming up. That, that is going to be drafted in this upcoming draft. Sure. But the Rangers didn't have a player like this. So you can't, I, I think I disagree with you there. Like the Rangers did it a different way where they traded a lot of what made their core, but they didn't trade their, their young talents per se. They kept, they kept, a, you know, they kept pieces that were going to grow with the new core of the team. Hell, they even kept Kreider. Like they didn't trade Chris Kreider. They didn't trade Zabinajad. So for, for the Chicago Blackhawks, I understand that you want to be terrible. I understand that you, you want to get the first overall pick and, and get all these phenomenal talents and this and that. But Alex Zabrink, it's 24 years old. And he just scored 41 goals last season. Like he scored 78 points, 41 goals in, in a whole season. And that kind of talent just doesn't go on trees, man. And he's not even technically at his prime yet. So the the idea that, okay, we're going to trade our 24-year-old star player for a package that wasn't really great, I think Chicago could have gotten a whole lot more. I don't really understand. I, I, I get like the, the idea that they traded to Brinkett just because Duncan Keith was retiring, I think is nonsense because the Chicago yeah. Blackhawks right now have by all accounts, a trillion dollars of cap space. Like they, uh, I, I don't understand this move for Chicago while I, I see the idea of, okay, let's just throw everybody out and we're just going to go eight, oh, Hopefully we're going to go oh eighty two and get the first overall pick. And it's, everything's going to be, peaches and rainbows but realistically i i don't see the value of trading a 24 year old talent like to brink at even if you want to be bad next season i don't get it it's a business thing it's just the principle of we don't want to pay somebody that much money on a team that isn't going to win anything and that's unfair to the fans it's unfair to the guys on that team and there is a bit of conjecture i've been reading a lot of the blackhawks writer stuff in the athletic the last couple of weeks and Both of Powers and Lazarus are both kind of of the opinion that they're trying to make this as inhospitable a team as possible so that Kane and Taze will agree to leave, that maybe they could convince Seth Jones to go somewhere else and truly be one of the worst teams ever assembled. Well, it's it's not about Seth convincing Seth Jones to go somewhere else. You got to convince other teams to trade for Seth Jones. Good luck with that. It's frustrating it is very frustrating as fans to deal with that i have quite a few blackhawk friends and my fan friends in my life and they are all kind of like well what do we do now why sign him to that deal first of all why 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 trade seth jones why why trade for seth jones and give him a bajillion dollars for a bajillion years if you were bad like you knew you were gonna be bad before last season started you were bad throughout the season and you are when you want to be really bad next season. So why trade for Seth Jones and give him essentially a lifetime contract for what purpose? What did that accomplish? I don't know. Well, that's that's because Bowman got fired. That's the other thing. Yeah, if Stan Bowman was still in charge. They would probably still be trying to pretend they were competing for a playoff. Spot. Sure. Yeah. I, 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 to me, it, it, like the writing was so on the wall for that. Like, when when the Chicago Blackhawks traded for for Seth Jones, immediately you thought, okay, this is not going to work out. Like, there's no there's no way that Seth Jones is one worth that contract, and two going to work out for for the for the duration of the contract in Chicago. Like, not neither of these things were happening. People knew this before, when the trade went down, and it's being highlighted even more now. Like, Seth Jones one is not good enough for that contract. Let's be objective honest with ourselves here like was Seth Jones better than 
a lot of people gave him credit for being last season. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't the worst player on the team. Like for for a good stretches of the of the time, like he he was a, a decent player for them. But now the the contract looks even sillier. Like if you want to be really bad, why did why convince Seth Jones to leave when you didn't have to sign up that contract in the first place? So, you know, Twitch sometimes doesn't like us, and that's okay because you know what? We're back. And it doesn't matter if Twitch likes us or not because we're back, baby. That's what's important here. Uh, but yeah, we were talking about Chicago. Uh, yeah, like their their roster just doesn't make any sense at all. And uh, I don't understand why Chicago felt the need to give Seth Jones a lifetime contract. To me, it didn't make any sense at the time. It didn't make sense over the course of the season. And it really doesn't make any sense now. So if they if somebody wants to trade for Seth Jones, you could have him for cheap, I guess. Maybe Chicago will retain 50% or 30% or something, because I don't think any team can fit Seth Jones and, and then just call it a day. Like you don't you don't just add Seth Jones to your lineup and say, you know what? We're done. Like, no, 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 no. You don't that's that's not a move that you that you finish with. App space is at such a premium in the NHL that when you get to this time of year, usually the only teams that have cap space are the God awful teams or the teams that just won the Stanley cup. That's why there's like no flexibility and why guys rarely actually get to unrestricted free agency. I mean, it speaks to why the market for Debrinket is what it was. I mean, from everything I read, that was basically the best they were going to do because not a lot of teams can fit $9 million in a $9 million cap hit without prior planning. Like that's a cap hit you have to set up going into the upcoming off season to go out and get them. Like when the Rangers were ready they knew, all right, this is the summer. We're going to have a chance to get Panarin. We got to have our money in order. You can't take $9 million on very easily in the NHL without having to make a subsequent move. It's why I've been so skeptical of Johnny Gaudreau going anywhere because the only team with the requisite cap space right now is Seattle, basically, is the only team that would make sense that has the cap space. Everybody well, saying he wants to go home to South Philly. He wants to be a flyer, blah, blah, blah. The Flyers have a hundred thousand dollars in cap space after trading for our old friend Tony D'Angelo. Yeah, well, and that you, it's funny that you mentioned uh, Johnny Gaudreau because David Pegnata a few minutes ago reported that if Gaudreau were to go to free agency, the Islanders are one of the teams that he could potentially be going to. The Islanders do have the cap space to make it work, and playing with Matt Barzell would be good for his career. It's just I don't think the Islanders are particularly close that you, you get I, like they're, they have the bones of a playoff team. The biggest hole they have in their lineup right now is they need one more top six forward. But again, I, with until I see what that team looks like without Barry Trotz as the coach, I'm going to be very skeptical of a team with Brock Nelson as its number two center of being anything to be particularly worried about. I know Brock Nelson had the career year last year. He had 32 goals, 33 goals, something like that. But that's a team with a lot of holes. I mean, they just traded for Alexander Romanov to replace Chara and you're going to trust 25, 20 to 25 minutes a night to a 22 year old who hasn't really ever been anything consistently, especially offensively. So if he were to go to the Islanders, I mean, that would instantly make the Islanders better, but I still don't think it makes them particularly close. And it speaks to the whole, there's just not a lot of cap space in the NHL because the cap is so low and it's difficult to acquire these high end players, especially as unrestricted free agents, because this is their one chance to cash out. It's why I never begrudge the players when they get the most money they possibly can, when they get to unrestricted free agency, as much as I complain about Truba's contract, about Goudreau's contract, a team was willing to give it to them. This is the way the market is set up that you pay for the bad years, because that's the only time players get to unrestricted free agency. It's why what the salary structures in the league being set up the way it is, where you don't get to unrestricted free agency till you're 27 years old, or you've been in the league eight years is ridiculous. If you wait that long, you get one good contract and that's it. If you can get a second contract after that, that means you're one of those guys like a Marty St. Louis, a Malkin, a Crosby, who's aged pretty well. But for the vast majority of guys, they get that one good payday and that's it. Before that, they're not making nearly as much as they possibly could. And it's purely so that the small market teams that don't make as much money can keep their better players. That's the only reason the NHL salary structure is set up like this. Yeah, I the 
the uh, you're, you're totally right there. Like there's just not a whole lot of, of anything to go around and you can't ever blame the players for signing the contract. Cause again, like, uh, first of all, uh, somebody is willing to give you that kind of money. Right. So yeah. if, if, if somebody was to call me, for example, <laughs> and say, Hey, I know you're making X at your current job. We'll give you a 300% raise to come here instead. Yes. I'm listening, right? Like it's, it, it and the same could be said about you and pretty much everybody out there in the workforce. Like hockey players aren't different by that. They're by, labor. Like, they yeah, are like labor. everybody, everybody's working to make ends meet. Hockey players get paid, but at the same time, if somebody's if, if another team is willing to to give them a lot more for essentially the same work, then yeah, of course you take that contract. Like the, the hockey players don't play a lot. Like some, a lot of players have a long career and they play 15, 16 years and all that. But a lot of hockey players don't play in the league for, for a million years. Like you have to take and any, it's, it's in every sport as well. Like yeah. take as much money as you can while you are still good at what you do, because you are an ACL tear. You are a, a concussion. You are whatever injury that you want to create here away from not being able to perform at the same level. So while you still can take the money, man, like take, yeah. take as much money as you want. I, I, I totally agree with you. Like there's literally no reason to, to shame a player for taking more when this is their livelihood, man. Like they've worked their entire lives to get here. And if somebody is willing to give you that kind of contract, it's on the team. It's not on the player. Yeah, for sure. So, the other big move that day was Doc getting moved in that three-way trade for Romanov. And again, the Blackhawks sold very low, a 21-year-old who's been a captain for Team Canada in various international competitions as a junior player, had a pretty good season two years ago before he broke his wrist, and is still only 21 years old, and he's got the prototypical size that NHL GMs drool over. I mean, a 6'3", 210-pound, 21, 22-year-old, still plenty of time to improve. Kind of feels weird to just jettison him, especially because he's not going to cost anything. But again, speaks to the weirdness and the the sheer, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, remorselessness, just, uh, okay, whatever. We're going to be as bad as we possibly can. And it doesn't really matter how we get there, but we can't have anybody on this team who might be good next year. And Doc is somebody who I would have liked the Rangers to take a chance on. Montreal is buying pretty low on a depressed asset. They're going to slide him in on a team that is going to be interesting to see where they go going forward because they've, they're going to accumulate a lot of talent. They had the first overall pick. They took the power winger over Shane. They took uh, Uri Slavkovsky. I remember how to say it. They took him over Shane Wright, who fell to fourth. Very weird. They took a power winger who had been playing in the Finnish league, who was on the Slovakia team, who with the Rangers third round pick, Adam Sakura, who we'll talk about a little bit, but, Weird things going on in the NHL. And I was talking about this the other day with hockey stat minor, where I just think everybody has no idea what anyone is worth in hockey. And it, we can, you brought it up before when we were talking about how Debrink it went for basically nothing. And that's why I never really buy into the, well, it's going to cost this asset, this asset, this asset, and this asset for player Y. If a 40 goal 24 year old with at minimum three more years of team control goes for a first round pick, a third round pick and a third round pick. What are we doing here? It really can't be that hard to go and get like a Jack Eichel who, you know, was consensus top five, 10 player at his position in the sport before his neck injury went for a first round pick, a roster player and a prospect. That's it. If the inefficiency in the trade market. And it's why I never get into the arguments on Twitter about, well, would you do this for that player? No, nobody is worth nearly as much as anyone thinks they're worth on Twitter. That, that's the way I want to tie up this thread. The, no roster, no player in the NHL is worth more than three or four assets at the most. And the conventional wisdom, roster player or a prospect, first round pick and mid round pick for pretty much anything bar McDavid tier player. I think that's a reasonable offer. Like, oh, the people out there, like, well, if the Rangers were to trade for JT Miller or for Patrick Kane, it would cost this, this. No, it wouldn't. It would cost Nils Lundqvist a first round pick 
and a third round pick or a roster player and a third round and a first round pick and Nils Lundqvist. Let's not overcomplicate this. Yeah, I like I think one of the, the one of the things to highlight here is that Kirby Doc was a third overall pick three years ago. Yeah, like Kirby Doc literally went third overall in the 2019 draft. And here he is being traded for pennies on the dollar. Now, there are a couple of concerns about Kirby Doc's game. Like as a third overall pick in his third full season in the NHL, he's got nine goals, right? Like the, the Chicago Blackhawks do want more out of that. Yeah, granted, he had a career year of 26 points over the course of a full season, which that's not what you want out of your third overall player. And I guess the Rangers could say the same thing about Cabo Caco, but these are two totally different players, right? Like Kirk, Kirby Doc, as a center this season, only won 32.8% of his faceoffs. And as a, as a centerman, like you need to be able to win faceoffs. And Kirby Doc hasn't been able to do that. Now, the Chicago Blackhawks, like, I, he, again, he's 21. Like, this man can barely buy a beer. Like, uh, the idea that one, he can't get better, and two, you can't just keep him, uh, it to me is weird. Like, yeah. e- even if, even if you want to tank all the way down to the bottom and be the worst team in the NHL, are you really telling me that right now Kirby Doc is the reason why you can't do that? The, Kirby Doc is the reason why the Chicago Blackhawks are going to win 50 games next season because he's on the roster. Like, I don't, I, this is baffling to me as somebody that enjoys hockey. That it's like, I, Kirby Doc is 21, can barely buy a drink, and you, he's third overall pick three years ago, and you traded for pennies on a dollar because of question mark? Like, I, I, I don't I don't really understand this move for Chicago, but as has been the norm for Chicago recently, I don't really understand anything that they're, that they're doing. So beats me. All right. So we've spent enough time talking about the big picture stuff. So let's cone in here a little bit more tighter and we can start talking about the goalie carousel with the Rangers because they were involved in it. Uh, they traded Georgiev to Colorado. They got assets back. They got assets back for somebody they were going to lose tomorrow for nothing. Good business deal, no matter what. As long as, as long as you got something in return, and they did a little bit better than I was expecting. They got two thirds and a fifth for a pending RFA. Colorado's going to gamble that if Georgiev plays more consistently behind a team that actually plays defense, his results will be better. And we saw in spurts as a Ranger that Georgiev was capable of playing. Slightly below what an NHL backup was his first two years in particular, significantly better than the last two years, which were not as good as his workload decreased his quality of play dipped. And it's understandable as a goalie. It's kind of like being a pinch hitter in baseball. You need to be in the lineup consistently and see pit live pitching often. Otherwise those few opportunities you do get against game action, it's not going to be the same, no matter how hard you try to simulate game situations in practice, it's never going to be what it is in a game. I hope Georgiev does well. He was a quality backup for Henrik Lundqvist. He was an okay backup for Shesterkin. He was the goalie for quite a bit of that 2019 season when, when they were kind of in that weird in-between. I mean, to estimate, to explain how far Georgiev has fallen in the perspective of the organization, remember last year when David Quinn was starting them evenly, 50-50, him and <laughs> Shesterkin, to start well, the season last year? David, David Quinn... <laughs> did do some questionable things over the course of his uh, coaching career here in New York. So just that's one of them. Uh, that, that's all I'll say about that. So that's the first leg of this carousel. So Colorado gets its new starter in Georgia from the Rangers for draft picks. That means Darcy Kemper is available now. The other one, the other leg of that is Washington traded Vitek Vanacek, who's been part of a tandem Always been around that league average, 905, 910 save percentage. The Capitals kept waiting for him to kind of seize the reins, whether it be him or Ilya Samsonov, who we're going to talk about in a second. One of those two guys, they've been spending the better part of the last two, three years waiting for one of them to launch. I mean, they let Philip Grubauer go, excuse me, they traded Philip Grubauer to Colorado. I think that was three years ago now with the assumption that one of Vanacek or Samsonov will take the starter reins and be well, do a good job at it. And neither of them was able to do that. We saw today that the Capitals non-tendered Samsonov. Doesn't mean they're totally not going to be able to bring him back, but unlikely that he goes back. So that leaves Washington with a clear cut. They don't have a goalie under contract right now. Toronto, 
does not have a starting goalie under contract. The Oilers do not have a goalie under contract. And there are still pieces out there. Darcy Kemper is out there. Jack Campbell is out there. There are rumors that the Islanders goalie, uh, Semyon Varlamov, is available if the right trade offer were to come along. So in terms of this goalie carousel, do you think any of them are good enough to elevate a, a team that needs them? Like, say, is Darcy Kemper going to Edmonton or Toronto going to really make that team that much better that it matters? Or is this just a case of we need a goalie, we're going to have to overpay for one because the game of musical chairs is about to stop? Well, the answer can be yes, and it can be at the same time, right? Like, Dar- yeah. is Darcy Kemper an elite top five goaltender in the NHL? No. But does he need to be in order for the Capitals to do better than they did last season? The answer is also no. So, yeah. like, if Darcy Kemper can show up to, to Washington and have a point nine one four save percentage yeah. or, a, you know, somewhere along those lines, and his goal save above average is better than Vanacek and Samsonov, then he's already doing what he's what he was brought in to do. It doesn't he doesn't need to be a Vasilevsky or or a Shesterkin or that kind of quality goaltender for his job to be a success story in Washington because all he has to do is come in and be better than the guys that that played before he did. So is Darcy Kemper the solution to the Capitals pro- to their problems? I I don't know if he is, but can he provide the stability that they need in net because v- Vanacek and Simpsona they were okay, they were good sometimes, but other times they were kind of inconsistent. There were times where you thought you thought okay, but like maybe they could be something and then the next three weeks, like they kind of didn't do much of anything. So if Darcy Kemper can provide nothing else but stability in net, then that's what the Capitals need right now. So, but by the way, the Caps like love drafting goaltenders only to give them away. They did yeah. it with Varlamov and Neuverth and and uh, Grubauer and Samsonov and Vanacek. Like they love drafting goalies working them up and then trading them away. I don't know what it is in Washington about these goalies, but they just, they can't stay put. It's a complicated position. We talked about it in the pre-show. We talked about it on last week's show and to tie a bow on this part, before we start talking about the Rangers draft and the rumor mill, the other one that is sitting around out there is Matt Murray to Toronto might be happening relatively soon. I, Ottawa's going to have to retain some money, but the assumption is that Toronto is still going to need a starting goalie, that they're not just going to ride Matt Murray. To tie a bow on this segment, does the devil's acquisition of Vanacek make them more stable and more of a team to be concerned with for the Rangers going forward? Not really. And okay. with with that, I like is again is Vanacek one of the best goalies in the league? The answer is no. If he was, if he was, then it would be a concern for the Rangers. But yeah, I mean he's he's going to be a good, a decent at least like one two punch with Blackwood, and we'll see what kind of play Blackwood comes up with once the season starts. Because I, as we've seen with Blackwood, he was good, and then he got COVID, and then never he never really recovered from getting COVID and he didn't play well last season. So really this is a show me year for Mackenzie Blackwood. We kind of don't know. And with Vanacek, like it, hope we hope for the best with these players, right? Like these, these are young kids that are still learning and, and they're not at their primes yet. Vanacek is a player that could by all means go to New Jersey, be in a different environment, be in a different system and thrive. That could very well be the case. We haven't seen that thus far with his play in Washington. And a lot of that doesn't necessarily stem from the, the system in front of him. Like there's just shots that he didn't stop. Yeah. So is Vanacek going to be uh, the, the solution in net for New Jersey? And does, does, does he solidify their goaltending? I mean, he makes it not bad, but we'll, this is kind of a wait and see on if it's anything more than that. Rangers do need a backup goalie. There are not a lot of great names out there. I'm not really interested in Thomas Grice. I'm not really interested. It doesn't seem like Braden Holpe is going to play next year. That's another name off the list. There's just, I'm not in, really interested in 37 year old, 36 year old Yarrow Halak. There's not a lot of good backups out there. It doesn't seem like any of the small army of like fourth and fifth round goalies over the last couple of years, whether it be Tyler wall or Adam Hauska are going to be the backup. So that is something to keep an eye on going forward for the Rangers. They haven't been linked to anyone at that position yet, which 
doesn't really give me a lot of confidence because we assume Shesterkin's going to start upwards of 55 to 60 games, but those other 22 games can't just be a punt. You do have to have at least a competent goalie in there. As the Devils can tell you, you can trot as many goalies in there as you want, but if they're not NHL goalies, they're just not going to be able to hack it. The Rangers got by with uh, Keith Kincaid the last two years as the third goalie on the depth chart. I don't think that's going to cut it if you realistically think you want to win this division and have a good chance at home ice in the first round, which by all accounts is what the goal is going to be going forward. So backup goalie is a position of concern and they don't have cap flexibility to invest in a backup goalie. It's why they like your give go. I think the one thing that kind of doesn't concern me with this is that the Rangers have a plan here because if they didn't have at least an idea of who were they who they were going to go after then they wouldn't have been so aggressive and trading for for trading away Georgiev because here's the thing like if you're if you're planning a uh if you're in control of a team and you're giving up a player in one of the most important positions on your team you have to have some kind of plan to replace him and the rangers not qualifying Georgiev they weren't planning on qualifying him at all they were planning on just letting him go so they already had an idea that okay Georgiev is not going to be on this team we need to find somebody to replace him with here's a list of ideas so they already came into the offseason knowing that Georgiev is not here so okay well we have a hole now we have a hole in our backup position who can we go ahead and acquire so this this just tells me that Chris at least in the backup goalie spot has some sort of plan and is going to carry that out come free agency because you don't plan in advance for for one of your goalies leaving and then come free agency have no idea what you're doing so i think while the rumors have been quiet about that position i think chris drury has his eye on somebody and that's one of the lesser concerning things that i have about chris drury heading into free agency Okay. We're not going to linger too long on the draft. The Rangers didn't have a first round pick. The two prospects that everybody kind of is unanimously in agreement of like a nodding aggressively at their head is Adam Sikora and Bryce McConnell Baker. So neither Andrew or I are prospect guys. I did a little bit of reading. I had a general idea of some of the guys who might be available in this range. I talked with Sam Stern a little bit about it just to kind of get an idea. And I read a few of the write-ups that a few prospect guys did about the Rangers draft. The two guys I just mentioned, Sikora and McConnell Baker, are top nine forwards. Ideally, these are going to be your cheap third-line guys on a team three to four years from now that are going to save you money in unrestricted free agency. The thing I read about Adam Sikora, very high motor, good chance to be an NHL player. That's the main reason these are the two players I'm choosing to highlight. The Rangers did have five players they selected, but these are the only two that kind of have a consensus chance of realistically making the league. And I talked about this a few weeks ago the, on, for my parting shot that the Rangers need to overhaul their development process, especially at the AHL level. They need to start turning some of these middle round draft picks into roster players to save money. Uh, I would love a nice high motor third line guy in the mold of a Tyler Mott who's coming in for 925 for the first four or five years of their existence in the NHL. It's very nice to have that type of skill set, especially under market value. And the more of these bottom six forward types, the Rangers accumulate, they have quite a few that they've been incubating for a while, whether you talk about Carl Henriksen or William Coley, eventually some of these guys got to make the team and save money in that bottom six because they don't have money to invest in that position group. Yeah, I, I really, these are names that like, okay, cool. Like they signed yeah. them, they they drafted them and hope they do something in the NHL, yeah. hopefully in a Rangers jersey. And that's, you know, something positive. But like these, these are players that we won't be seeing and won't be hearing from for at for least the next couple of seasons. So right now, while this is a move for the future, these are players that could potentially help down the road. If that, it, it's really just kind of, I don't want to say a punt, right? I, but but this draft for the Rangers, in essence, was a punt because yeah. like they didn't have a first round pick. They didn't trade into the first round. They didn't see anybody that was worthy of trading in the first round for. And all these picks, while great, again, like hopefully all these guys make the league and they're and you know and they contribute in a positive way and, and all that fun stuff. But 
for the next couple of seasons, this this draft, by all accounts, does not matter. For the next couple of seasons, is it's as if the Rangers didn't have a single pick at all. And maybe in a few years from now, Sakura and you know some, uh, some of these other guys that, that the Rangers tra- drafted could be something. But at least for the next couple of seasons, this draft, in essence, did not exist. So <laughs> now you have to look ahead to, okay, next season, you got to still fill these holes. Do we have the necessary depth from the AHL or, or equivalent to fill these holes. And I don't know, do they? There's a good chance. They're going to give Cully a chance to make the team this fall. He didn't get invited to prospect camp, which is usually a sign that he's going to get invited to full training camp, the regular one with a chance to make this team, the team in the fall. Maybe that's the plan to replace Tyler Mott, because as we're about to talk about in free agency, uh, Elliot Friedman talked about it on 32 thoughts on Monday that even though what Molly Walker reported and we talked about last week doesn't seem to be coming to fruition that Mott and the Rangers were going to come to something was where we were at last week. And then I listened to 32 thoughts today on the way home and was no, he thinks he's going to be able to get a good, he's going to be able to get sticker price in unrestricted free agency, which the Rangers won't be able to do for a fourth line wing. So that's a little bit disappointing, but maybe the Rangers have their internal fix. William Cully, maybe Carl Hendrickson, who, if I remember correctly, didn't get invited to training camp because he had something with a visa issue, excuse me, prospect camp because of a visa issue where the, it was an entire thing in the athletic. They wrote a story about it a couple of weeks ago that because of the pandemic restrictions, a lot of players got temporary visas or workarounds where they got into the country without visas and didn't have to really worry about it because they got special exemption status, but that's something they got to rectify. Okay. The main, the meat and potatoes of this episode is the rumor mill. The Rangers, as one of the mar- league's marquee teams, the league's most valuable franchise, get linked to every single team. Agents love to link the Rangers to their clients. The media loves to link the Rangers to players that are available. They're trying to drive up the price. Free, the ma- Friedman mentioned the Rangers and the Islanders with Nazem Kadri today. Nazem Kadri is reportedly seeking north of eight and a half million dollars a season. I do not understand how the Rangers could possibly fit into that equation. They've been linked to Evgeny Malkin at more speculation than reporting. They've been linked to Patrick Kane again, more speculation than reporting all these big names out there. None of them really interest me. I'm just going to be honest with you. None of them really interest me for what the Rangers are going to be this year or next year. And that's what matters because next year, the Rangers have no cap space. Yeah, I mean, these names are interesting, but there's yeah. no realistic chance that the Rangers are going to get them. Like, Nazem Kadri can want the key to the city. The Rangers can't afford it. So, I, yeah, I mean, while Kadri can be like, yeah, I want to be a Ranger. I want to come to New York. Okay. Like, are you going to take a major pay cut to come here? Because the Rangers can't afford to pay you remotely what you're looking for. So if you were to take a, a James Harden esque deal to return, you know, to, to come to a place and essentially take, a, if you, if you're not a basketball fan, which is okay, James Harden got traded to Philadelphia and then his contract was up at the other season. He took a $15 million pay cut to stay with the team so that the, the Sixers can sign more players to, to build around the team. If Nazem Kadri wants to do that in New York, I guess. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Like if Nazem Kadri were to sign a $4 million deal to come to the Rangers for, for one season or for two seasons, then yeah, by all means come, come here. But how realistic is that? I, I wouldn't bet on it. So while all, all these rumors about, yeah, Kadri wants to come here. Bobby Holik wants to come here. The ghost of Michael Jordan is prime wants to come here. Like that's all great and everything, but the Rangers can't fit that in the cap. So good luck. The one that always sticks in my mind of just kind of how gullible the vast majority of people on Twitter was, was the year Steven Stamkos got to unrestricted free agency and everybody kept banging the table. Yeah, the Rangers are going to have a meeting with Stamkos and they had a million dollars in cap space and none of the people making any real money. All of them had no trade clauses. So, yes, the Rangers are a very easy way to get a little bit of attention, especially if you're especially if you're more of a content creator than a reporter, you throw the Rangers in there. The Rangers fan base is very vocal and very easy to get engagement with online. There are quite a few people who love to do that. 
the click cling himself. Larry Brooks did it last Saturday with Patrick Kane. He did where, it today with Brett Howden. Oh, I didn't see that. He, I, I wasn't really he, on Twitter. Today. He, yeah. He, he mentioned that uh, Sonny Mulatto didn't get a yeah. QO from the ducks. And he's like, Oh, what if the Rangers sign him? But they also could sign Brett Howden from, from the Vegas golden Knights. Cause he's, as we know, a for some reason, a massive fan of Brett Howden and thinks Brett Howden is the next Sidney Crosby. So uh, take that for what you will. But Larry Brooks, if nothing else, knows how to get his knows how to get his clicks. So let's start unpacking these one on one. We started with Kadri, and we there's no real way to get him in here unless he wants to take the the seven year max four four and a half million a year. If he was willing to do that, sure. Short of that, there's no way to make that work. Next up on the list is Malkin. The only way Malkin works is if he does one year. That is the only way it works. And there is a world in which that could make sense because he's 35 going on 36 years old. He's coming off a season where he was a point per game player, but he only played, I think, 44, 45 games because he had major knee surgery last summer. He seems to be the sticking point in Pittsburgh seems to be that he wants a fourth year, which Pittsburgh doesn't seem to be willing to give him. So I doubt he would be willing to take a one year thing with the Rangers. That's the only way it works. Next year, they're going to have even less cap space, and they're going to need to take care of Miller and Lafreniere, who, in theory, should be taking up that last seven, eight million dollars in cap space between the two of them. Yeah, and Rob Ross, I'm looking at my top left here because I have the tweet on my on my other screen here. The I, the tweet that he put out uh, about an hour ago said that the Penguins never offered four years to Evgeny Malkin. His yeah. camp reportedly tried to get there with Ron Hexel, who's the general manager, and closest they got was, quote, what it could look like. The four-year contract was not on the table from the Penguins. So Evgeny Malkin could want four years, but if the Penguins aren't willing to give it to him, then who will? Uh, there's at this at this stage of his career and while he's still a great player when he's healthy and out there as you mentioned if a 35 year old gets major knee surgery that's still a red flag no matter who you are like if Crosby gets to that point you know if, if, if Crosby needs another surgery or if Ovechkin needs a big surgery like that like that's a red flag no matter who you are because of the age and the mileage that you have on your body so teams don't want to go there with Malkin. And a lot of Penguins fans are upset because the Penguins don't want to give him four years. I think they gave Latang six. Yeah. The Which, thing is, yeah, that's that's a whole thing in, in its own right. But here, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, what were you going to say? I was talking with my friend Hunter Hodes, who hosts the Locked On Penguins podcast about this. And his reasoning for the Latang extension makes sense. The Penguins know they're going to be bad once Crosby leaves in three years. So it doesn't really matter that they gave Latang six because the second half of that contract, he'll either be stashed on long-term injured reserve or he will play out the contract on a bad team because all assumptions are that when Crosby's contract expires in three years, he's going to retire or he's going to move to play for another team. I don't understand why they're taking such a firm line on Malkin when they were willing to do it with Latang, under the assumption that if Sid is leaving in three years or retiring in three years, it doesn't really matter what happens after that. Because as long as you have those three, in theory, you should be able to make the playoffs in the Metro. And whatever happens after Sid leaves, it doesn't really matter because Sid left. And once Sid leaves, you're not going to be that good. Yeah, and the Penguins kind of are in a limbo state right now yeah. where they still have Crosby. They still have Latang, They still have Gensel. Yeah. What after that do they really have in their team? Like we don't like, we know they're going to be a good team because Crosby is still there. and Latang is still there. And Mike Sullivan is a phenomenal coach. So they will get there somehow, but they have a lot of questions on this roster. Like if Malkin leaves, let's say Evan Rodriguez leaves. They need to fill a lot of these holes. What are they going to do? Sign Kadri to a mil- to a bajillion dollars? They can't really do that if they're planning on Crosby to either retire or leave in three years. So what is the plan? What is the structure for Pittsburgh this season? Because right now we're kind of getting mixed sing- signals of, okay, well, we're just going to give Latang the key to the city because we can, but Malkin, for whatever reason, nah, like four years, ah, that's too much. Like, ah. If you're going to do one at, at that point, just do it. Do for both. The, do both. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't get it. Yeah. So to tie, to kind of conclude the Malkin 
Rangers can only do it if it's one year. If he was willing to come here for one year, I think I'd be more than content. I'd be fine with that. One year, six million. One year, six and a half. If he was willing to do that, by all means, lock it down one year. You wait, you see, you got to figure out the second line right wing to play with Malkin and uh, Panarin. But that would be fine. That would solve the Rangers second line center problem for now. Yeah, I mean, Malkin, if he wanted to come here for for one season, then and he could he could be great for them if he was yeah. healthy, if he was healthy, that's, 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 kind of, that's kind of the key here because if Malkin comes and let's say he re injures his knee or he gets another injury, that's a major problem for the Rangers because then like they're, they're kind of out a second line center and yeah, you can move Hedl up and you, you can kind of finagle things while you wait for the tank for, from, from Malkin, sorry to, to come back. But it's not like Malkin has a clean bill of health. Yeah. And that's kind of my concern with handing Malkin the second line center position is, yeah, while he'd be great on this team and he would solidify a, an offense that desperately needs somebody like Malkin, is he, can he play? Can yeah. he play 82 plus the playoffs? Or at least like give me 60 in the regular season, like 65? Can can he do that? I don't know. But if he wants to come here for cheap on a one year deal, which again, I don't I don't think is going to happen. But if he did want to come here for a one year deal cheap, sure, why not? All right, the one that's kind of been the lightning rod is Patrick Kane because he's got all of the off the ice stuff, which for a lot of people is a non starter. I'm amongst them. I don't particularly want Patrick Kane on my hockey team. I already have enough guilt on my conscience rooting for a team owned by James Dolan. I don't really need to have somebody who's been accused of sexual assault three separate times, who beat up a cab driver over spare change, who was at worst, at the very least, complicit in the Kyle Beach situation, and at worst was an active tormentor aggressor in that situation. I don't need that con- on my conscience on my hockey team. Purely as a hockey player, nobody's going to argue. Kane is probably the best American hockey player of all time. He put up 90 points last year, 80-something points last year. Still, obviously, a competent NHL player. Doesn't really give you a lot of five-on-five. Five. Same problem with a lot of the Rangers' top six forwards already. Gives you nothing defensively. I would say is a negative defensively. Again, Yes, he is a good hockey player. I don't want him on my team for the off the ice stuff. And again, he's more of what the Rangers already have. He's fine on the power play and he's a very high end player, but he cherry picks a lot on defense where he's not going to be actively involved in trying to get the puck back. He's going to be floating at the blue line, trying to lead a breakout going the other way. He's not as good in transition as he used to be. He's still above average in transition, I will be fair, but he's not going to be able to drive a line the same way he used to. If you want to play him opposite Panarin and put Heedle in the middle, fine. And then there's also the just the acquisition cost because he's making ten and a half million. Chicago's going to have to retain half of that. And if Chicago is going to retain half of that, they're going to want more back from the Rangers. And the assumption would be they're going to be taking roster players as opposed to draft picks. You're getting further away from your goal if you're giving away a Heedle, a Kako, a a young roster player in getting another top six forward. So while Kane is an idea that definitely I get why people would speculate there's a match there, I just don't see the match there. And I just don't want him, to be frank. I would agree with you. I the, for a lot of the reasons that you said, like if if the Rangers wanted a power play guy, I guess my, get get Mike Hoffman, man. Right? There's <laughs> there's no like you already have a Mike Hoffman in in I get for 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 the playoffs anyway because we saw a lot of what Panarin, Zibanejad, and Kreider did over the course of the playoffs where they were phenomenal on the power play, but not not really good at five on five. So if you want, like I don't understand why the Rangers would want another guy like that right now. And it's not like Kane is, is 26, 27. Like my guy is, you know, he's getting up there in age and he's, is what like 33 right now, which yeah, isn't, isn't like old by any means, but he, it's not like he's 25, 26. So at this stage of his career, if he's cheating on defense, if he's not providing much at five on five, that's who he is. And it's not going to change just because he's in a different Jersey all of a sudden, like be- we saw Panarin, Zabinajad and Kreider do it during the playoffs. And it's not like Gerard Gallant fixed it then. So bringing in another guy that does the exact same thing on this team 
is going to achieve nothing. Like, is Patrick Kane a great player? I I guess off the ice, yeah, same same kind of deal with with him. Like, I I kind of don't want him on my team. But that's beside the point. Like, there's what does he tangibly provide for this Rangers team that they don't already have? More power play offense? They kind of have that already. So, is Patrick Kane going to drive five on five offense? The answer was no in Chicago. It's not going to be a yes in New York. It's, and again, he's a trade target. So you would have to get him to agree to waive because he's got a no move clause. I don't think that would be an issue. I think New York is a reasonable landing spot where if he wanted to leave, the Rangers could definitely make that happen. You're going to have to send stuff back. I mean, you're probably sending your first round pick next year. And then you're probably sending Kittle, Kako, or Nils Lundqvist, if not two of those three, as opposed to a draft pick in one of those three. You're you're taking away from what you already have to get there, and that's why I just I the the position I've come around on is I don't think going out and getting somebody big this summer makes sense. Even as much as I like Pierre Luc Dubois' game, even if you were to go out and get him, I just don't think there's a world in which getting one of those guys to and adding them to this group makes them a cup contender this year and is worth the gamble of screwing up your team finances going forward. Cause you saw it, you trade for Kane. Now he needs a contract at the end of this season. What is he going to be willing to take next year? And are you really going to give up assets for one season of 33 year old Patrick Kane and then revisit it down the road? It's all of the players that are out there right now, especially the ones you would have to trade for. They need new contracts. And after this upcoming season, the Rangers aren't going to have the financial flexibility to give anybody a long-term extension. That's not already in house. And that was kind of the whole point of rebuilding for four years was you take care, you develop these guys along in house. So they're going to be cheaper than what you would get in free agency or trading for them. And we need to see what they are. And that's why I think the Rangers probably end up being a little less good than they were last year. They let the young guys ride. And I think that's realistically the most feasible plan going forward, at least for next season, is you don't go out and get anything crazy this year. If you can find somebody who wants to bet, if you want to bet on upside on somebody who's going to take a one-year deal as a prove-it thing, like what Evan Rodriguez did in Pittsburgh last year, if there's somebody non-tendered out there like Dylan Strome, you really want to roll the dice on for one year and see what they could do, I'd be open to that. Don't tie up money long-term. I think that's the most important thing I could say about what the Rangers do this summer. Do not tie up money long-term because you need the flexibility going forward. I think one of the biggest things that you said was the Rangers might not be as good this year as they were last year. And like that, that is the, that cannot be lost here by yeah. fans of this team because the Rangers by all accounts should have been out in the first round. They should have been. The only reason why they won is because the, the Penguins didn't have a goaltender. Yeah. They, they thoroughly got dominated by Pittsburgh for the vast majority of the series. The only reason the, the the Rangers somehow pulled it out is because Louis Domingue is not an NHL goaltender and they took advantage of that. And, and even, you know, like even when the goalie came back in, in, in game seven, like he, he just Tristan Jari, when he came back, like he just wasn't healthy. You saw him after the, after the game, like he had a, a huge ice pack on his, on his foot. Like clearly he wasn't prepared to play. He couldn't play and he tried his best, but ultimately he just wasn't healthy enough. Like if the Penguins had a decent goaltender in net that could, hold the fort for Jari, or even if Jari was healthy for that series, the Rangers aren't winning that series. They got dominated. Let's be honest with ourselves here. So the, they got to the conference finals. Yes, but it's not, it's not as if all these names are out there right now, the Rangers are going to acquire and then go back their next season. I think it, this, there's a legitimate chance of what's probably going to happen is that while the Rangers will still make the playoffs next season, they might not win a million games like they did this past season. They might not make the conference finals like they did this past season. They might kind of status quo and see what they have and see what they and see what guys like Hedl and Lafreniere Kako are going to be with bigger roles. And we'll just kind of see how they how they play and if they improve and all these things. And then after next season, that is where a lot of these decisions are going to be made because then you'll have a much better understanding of, okay, these are our top prospects. 
this is how they did with given bigger roles, given more ice time, given more responsibility. And this is how they performed. Do we trust them to be the future of this team moving forward? If the answer is yes, then you give him long-term deals and you fill holes as you see fit. If the answer is no, then you trade them and bring in guys that you feel will help this team moving forward. So right now, I think this upcoming season is going to be a lot of either status quo slash maybe a first, second round exit. And then that the following season, that's, that's going to be the most important off season for the Rangers for the next, I want to say at least five to seven years, because that, then a lot of the questions that we currently have are going to be answered. Yeah, it's it's a lot of uncertainty right now. I mean, we're all kind of in that danger zone where anything could kind of happen, and I would believe it. You could tell me, yeah, they traded Nils Lundqvist next year's first-round pick and a third-round pick for Patrick Kane at 50% retained, and they're going to roll the dice on this season. And that's going to tie into what my, I talk about in my parting shot uh, late in towards the end of our episode, which we're getting to. This is kind of the the litmus test of do they think they're good to go to be cup contenders next year, or are they going to take a little bit more of a long range approach to their roster construction? Because they've been very in between. I mean, everything they did last summer would tell you they thought they were ready to contend because they were buying um, what sort of premium things. They were buying a fourth line center at above market value to kill penalties. They were buying a fourth line winger to be intimidating and they were trading for somebody who they thought if they gave him a bigger role in Sammy Blay, that they'd be able to tap into production that he, they hadn't gotten before. Those are all moves that a team that thinks they're ready to contend makes. And I don't think the Rangers probably are contenders yet. I, I think they absolutely got a little bit of the goalie God on their side they got a little bit of power play luck and they outlasted teams. They just outlasted teams in the playoffs and luck is part of this. That is absolutely part of going deep in the playoffs. You need a little bit of luck on your side. If you don't have it, you're not going to go particularly far in the playoffs and the Rangers had it this year, but just banking on luck is not a strategy going forward. Yeah. You can't bank on your first round opponent, not having their two NHL goaltenders. You can't bank on, the you know your power play to be as dominant as they were over the course of the as it was over the course of the first two rounds of the playoffs and even in Tampa Bay as well to a certain extent like you can't you can't expect the same things to to go exactly the same way with the same roster slash a little bit of a of a tune up here and there and expect everything to just be okay like you can't you can't do that if you are building for the playoffs then you really have to build for the playoffs. And if you're not, and you're kind of this in-between of, okay, well, we are acquiring one or two players. Let's see what happens. Why not? Like, you, you, can't, you can't really do that and expect it to achieve the same result year in and year out. It, it went well this season because they made the conference finals. There were two wins away from the Stanley Cup final. You can't expect the same thing to happen again if you do the same thing again. Like that, that was very luck dependent. And as luck as as any gambler would know, sometimes luck just isn't on your side, man. Yeah. All right. You went first last week. I'll get into mine now. I simply wrote down it's time to see what Chris Story is made of. So, like we just said, made aggressive moves last summer to acquire specific players to fulfill specific roles, the kind of way that a baseball team would fill out their lineup where they get a specific guy who only hits left-handed pitching, only hits right-handed pitching, a defensive specialist, a certain type of relief pitcher, these kind of incremental things that you think is going to be the difference between winning and losing in the playoffs, because you're just looking for that slight bit of edge and the Rangers were banking on more intangibles, making the difference over the course of a seven game series. And to some degree that did pay off for them. Now, to get to that point, they also overpaid for all of these players. They committed long-term to one of them in particular in Barkley Goodrow. They gave Ryan Reeves an extension ahead of last season to get him to come back for this upcoming season. And by all accounts, had a brutal offseason last summer. Kind of 
reset the expectations for him as a general manager at the trade deadline, where, again, by all accounts, had a pretty good trade deadline in getting Andrew Kopp and getting Frank Vitrano and getting Tyler Mott and Justin Braun. All reasonable costs. The only one that really cost anything significant, Kopp, which turned into a first-round pick because the Rangers went that far. Okay, now it's time to see if there is actually a coherent plan here to build something that is going to be sustainable for the next five to 10 years, or if they're going to go for the sugar high and say, well, we were pretty close last year. Let's go all in this year and we'll worry about the consequences later. I think that delineation and that decision is going to tell you everything you need to know about Chris Drury as an executive, because if he's going to play the, we were that close last year, all we need to do is get a little bit better right now and not be as concerned about the long-term future of the team. And this is going to tie into Andrew's parting shot. That's the same old Rangers. That is what they did for the better part of a decade. And they kept trying to get a little bit closer to that finish line, a little bit closer to that finish line. And eventually the finish line started moving away from them. And that's the way this works. Just because you got a little bit better, that doesn't mean everybody else is going to wait around for you to meet that threshold. There will be somebody better next year. Colorado just lost five or six unrestricted free agents. Florida is going to lose five or six unrestricted free agents. All of these teams are going to have movement over the next couple of weeks. And where the Rangers shake out in that order is really going to come down to if they think they're close or not. Andrew and I don't think that this team is one or two players away. They are probably three or four players away based on the holes right now, this moment, as we're recording. Maybe they can answer most of those holes over the next couple of weeks with some creative moves. They're not obvious ones on the chessboard. So we're going to wait and see, and we're going to find out what Chris Drury thinks about his hockey team. Yeah, my parting shot, and you mentioned it, that the Rangers can't be the same old Rangers. They can't, they can't go after the shiny can't piece of candy that they saw in the candy store you know if, if you're if you're a little kid walking past the candy store you see the the shiny candy through through the window and you're tugging at your mom like mommy mommy like can i can you buy me that shiny piece of candy like the rangers cannot do that because here's the thing like you you have to build your team based off of how they play with each other and you have to build the best possible team uh, that that fits within that jigsaw puzzle because if you're if your team is composed of let's say you're building this jigsaw puzzle and you have you know 18 pieces to complete this board and you bring in some some piece from another set like it, it's not going to fit the the jigsaw puzzle that you're making within that moment like if you're missing three to four pieces of your of your puzzle and you buy some other set well, yeah, of course the pieces aren't going to fit because it doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't. Like, you have to be cognizant of the way that you're structuring your team. Getting Patrick King doesn't make sense for this team. Getting Nazem Kadri doesn't make sense unless he, sign, unless he wants a massive pay cut, which I don't think he will. Like, you have to build to your team's needs as opposed to, ooh, a piece of candy. This dude's available. Like, you can't build like that if you if you really want to contend for the Stanley Cup. As, as I'm sure Kane jerseys would sell. I'm sure Patrick Kane jerseys are, would, would go flying off the shelves if he, if he got traded to the Rangers. But is he the right piece that makes the Rangers a Stanley Cup contender? The answer is no. So you stay away. If the Rangers are the same old Rangers, they're just going to trade for Patrick Kane, trade for Luke Dubois, and then hope for the best. But if if this is the new Rangers that we're looking at here, that are really looking at this objectively, that are really looking at the long term here, and and look and saying to themselves, Patrick Kane is not the answer. Nazem Kadri on a on the deal on the deal that he's looking for is not the answer, and we just have to go year by year with this that is the best way to go about it because if they just go oh shiny candy let me get kane let me get kadri let me get malkin let me get all these guys and we'll worry about everything else later that like you we can't we've done that already we've done that for 25 years now and look where that's gotten us we just have zero cups to show for it yeah they've gotten to the final they got to a couple of conference finals but they did not have the correct team in place to win the stanley cup so if the Rangers want to win, they have to learn from their prior mistakes. Got to get as many cracks at it as possible. I think that's the most important thing that we can emphasize here as we wrap up, because it ties to both our points. 
A team doesn't go all in one year and it come together often. Colorado had gone all in three years in a row and they finally broke the dam and got through. Washington, it took them 14 years of Ovechkin's prime to finally win a Stanley Cup. The Blues, it took them, I think they traded for Ryan O'Reilly in 2017. So we'll say three, four years of consistently being an average playoff team. The Rangers are going to need to make the playoffs at least probably two or three more times over the next five years to get a really good crack at it. So going all in this year and next year, that's not the answer. You waited four or five years of a rebuild from 20, from them losing to Ottawa in 2017 to making the conference final this year. You waited five years for a realistic chance at winning a Stanley Cup. You cannot say, okay, well, we were really close last year. Let's go for it this year. And then, oh, well, we missed the playoffs the following year. That is not a recipe to win the Stanley Cup. You need to make the playoffs as many times as possible. And one of those times, maybe everything lines up and you go all the way. Yeah, and by the way, I, as an aside, your hat says I watch hockey for the plot, and I think that's an elite hat, and I need to know where I can buy one. Oh, I will happily plug my friend Dave's art because Dave, I love Dave. I don't know if he has them in the store right now because he sold them out a while ago. Where's Hockey Dave? Hockey Dave. Dave. So Dave's ad on Instagram is Hockey Enjoyer. He has a few things in his shop. I don't know if the hat is in there right now. I can text him and see the next time he's going to have them, but great hat. Dave is a very good follow. He's an artist. He does commissions. A lot of good content. Uh, Support your content creators out there, not just Andrew and I, anybody whose work you enjoy, podcast, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, whatever. Any engagement means the world to people like us. So throw them a follow, like their work, share their work. Anything you can do to help a content creator spread the word a little bit more, that's the lifeblood of our work, and it really means a lot to us. So please support your content creators. Absolutely. And and if you're not a top tier content creator, then you're not getting paid a whole lot, if anything at <laughs> all. Like you have to understand yeah. that we right now are not getting paid to do what we're doing. We do, we, or we are doing it to build something. And right now, and maybe in the future, we could potentially see that. But right now we see nothing. We, we yeah. make nothing by giving us by giving up our time and our energy and our and our voices because we we're yelling about this team for for over an hour like we we don't get paid from from see, from doing this so we are doing it because we enjoy what we do and want, we we want to build something here so it, anytime you can share or you know support even donate like if if that's if you have a couple of extra dollars and you want to give some money to a content creator like uh what was it what was the name ad hockey enjoyer like any yeah. any any time that you can do that that means the world to, to anybody that is making these things. Cause yeah. you know, unless you, unless you have a million followers on, on your platform, then you're just not making a whole lot, if anything at all. So like even a retweet, a share, whatever, like that, that goes a long way to, to every single content creator that, that isn't, you know, the, one of the top in, in, in the field. If you don't have a, if, if you don't have a blue check mark next to your name, basically like support, support it, man. Cause like support's yeah. a really important thing here. So he has them up for pre-order. I'll send you the link once we're done recording and we'll get you hooked up. Awesome. That'll do good. it for episode number five in the books. So you can follow Andrew at Chelney Andrew, C-H-E-L-N-E-Y. You follow me at Nick Sarari, C-A-R-A-R-I-S on Twitter is the personals. Liberty Blue Pod on everything except YouTube. On YouTube, it is Liberty Blue Podcast. Full video episode will be up there sometime Tuesday. Should be up there Monday night, as long as my computer cooperates. But for your viewing pleasure on Tuesday, Andrew will be working on the audio as soon as we wrap up here. Should be available on all your major podcasting platforms. We will see you guys next week and maybe put on a helmet for the next few days. It might get a little intense around here. <laughs> Yeah, we're we might we might yell. We might you might want to put the earplugs in because if something if something goes down that we're not fans of, oh, 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 we're gonna let you know. Don't you worry. Yeah, if you see a Twitter space at like 1201 Thursday afternoon, you'll know the Rangers probably did something catastrophic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we won't even wait for the for the stream. We'll we'll get on this Twitter space immediately and just start yelling. So keep an eye out for that. That'll just about do it for this week's show. We hope you guys enjoyed. Have a good week. We'll see you guys next week. And maybe the Rangers do something crazy, or maybe we just all go crazy on Twitter. We'll see you guys then, and we'll find out. Later.